the Prophet Musa. The River Nile. Egypt, with its 3,000 years of history, is one of the oldest civilizations in the world and was founded on the banks of the Nile in the region then known as Lower Egypt. Based on a territory stretching from the Nile Delta towards the south, Egypt became one of the wealthiest and most powerful states of the time. The Egyptians achieved a very advanced knowledge of mathematics, astronomy, architecture, and art. With this knowledge they acquired, they built palaces and pyramids whose secrets have still not been unraveled to this day. The civilization of ancient Egypt took its glorious place on the stage of history for the period of time allotted to it, and then disappeared. Ancient Egypt, which seemed so civilized on the surface, was in fact an order built on the blood and tears of innocent people. Indeed, God describes ancient Egypt in the Quran as a clear example of a system of denial. In one verse of the Quran, one of the cruel rulers of Egypt, Pharaoh, declares his own divinity in his own words. My people, does the kingdom of Egypt not belong to me? Do not all these rivers flow under my control? Do you not then see? The people of Egypt worshipped idols they made with their own hands and hoped for blessings from these statues. One of the fundamental inconsistencies of this system of denial was the way that the kings regarded themselves as gods. The kings, who believed themselves to be divine, would marry their own sisters in order to prevent their blood mixing with those of ordinary people. They would have the divine decrees they issued in the light of their own earthly passions and desires imposed on those around them and eliminated anyone who opposed their rule. These kings were the pharaohs who ruled the Egyptian civilization for hundreds of years. So great was the power of the pharaohs over the people of Egypt that everyone submitted to them. These kings were the rulers, owners, and administrators of the whole state, the territories of the country, and the Nile. All forms of production in the country were kept under tight control and offered to the pharaoh. Pharaoh, in turn, made most unjust use of these in favor of the social class closest to him. Those not of the people of Egypt had no right to life or speech. As a result of the injustice which stemmed from the Pharaoh's power and capricious rule, the non-Egyptian slaves bore the brunt of the oppression. Monarchical rule and slavery have existed in all civilizations in history. But the slaves in Egypt suffered to an extent unknown in any other civilization. Every pharaoh in the history of ancient Egypt had temples and cities built to demonstrate his power and wealth. Thousands of slaves were ruthlessly worked to death in the construction of these cities. They had no right to rest. Slaves were never regarded as part of the Egyptian people. They were deprived of the right to life and free speech while the people of Egypt lived in plenty and abundance. This slave class were the children of Israel 
descended from the line of the prophet Ibrahim. According to the verses of the Quran, the Egyptians enslaved and oppressed the children of Israel to keep the system of slavery going. The oppression of the children of Israel had reached such levels that even their numbers were controlled. Women capable of serving were kept alive, and newly born male children ruthlessly slaughtered. God describes the situation in one verse addressed to the children of Israel. Remember when we rescued you from the people of Pharaoh. They were inflicting an evil punishment on you, slaughtering your sons and letting your woman live. In that there was a tremendous trial for you from your Lord. It was in such an environment that God sent the messenger who would do away with this oppression and cruelty, warn people to turn to the true path and free the children of Israel from slavery. That messenger was the prophet Musa. The prophet Musa was born to a family of the enslaved children of Israel. His mother feared that her son would be killed by Pharaoh's soldiers. That fear continued until she received a revelation from God. God revealed to the mother of the prophet Musa what she had to do. Before Pharaoh's men could kill the baby, the mother of the prophet Musa placed him in a chest and left him afloat on the water of the Nile. The current carried the prophet Musa to Pharaoh's palace. The family of Pharaoh picked him up so that he might be an enemy and a source of grief to them. Certainly Pharaoh and Haman and their troops were in the wrong. The wife of Pharaoh said, A source of delight for me and for you. Do not kill him. It may well be that he will be of use to us, so perhaps we could adopt him as a son. They were not aware. Thus, following the decree predetermined by God, Pharaoh and his family rescued the prophet Musa from the river and adopted him. The prophet Musa began to be raised like a noble Egyptian in Pharaoh's palace. The prophet Musa grew up in Pharaoh's palace. He came of age, and God gave him knowledge and wisdom. The event which marked a turning point in his life was a fight in which he was involved. In this fight, the prophet Musa took the side of the man who was from his party, without looking into who was in the right. Though he did not intend to kill him, the other man died from the blow. The prophet Musa realized he had erred and repented, seeking refuge in God. He begged God to forgive the sin he had committed. He promised never to be on the side of sinners in the future. However, the prophet Musa had killed an Egyptian. The Egyptians would seek their revenge. As we are told in the Quran, the prophet Musa spent the night in hiding. Pharaoh and the leading men beside him discussed Musa's punishment. 
even the possibility of executing him. Someone who overheard the discussion came to warn Musa. At this, the Prophet Musa left the city and went away from Egypt. The Prophet Musa turned to the east of Egypt, to Midian, beyond the Sinai Desert. Throughout all that had happened to him, the Prophet Musa continued to trust in God and pray to him. On the way to Midian, he said, Hopefully my Lord will guide me to the right way. The Prophet Musa encountered two women by the waters of Midian. The women were frightened of the other shepherds there and were unable to water their animals. The Prophet Musa ran to the women's assistance and watered their flocks. In return for this behavior, the women's father invited the Prophet Musa to pay his wages for drawing water for them. He asked the Prophet Musa to stay with them and to help him. He said that he would give one of his daughters to the Prophet Musa as his wife. The Prophet Musa accepted this proposal. Musa honored the agreement he made with the old man and stayed in Median for many years. When the agreement had come to an end, Musa and his family left Median. On their journey, Musa saw a fire in the distance, on the side of the Mount Sinai, which he was passing by with his family. When they reached it, God called out to the prophet Musa, giving this revelation. Musa, I am your Lord. Take off your sandals. You are in the holy valley of Tuwa. I have chosen you, so listen well to what is revealed. I am God. There is no God but me. So worship me and establish prayer to remember me. This was the first revelation Musa received. He was now a messenger of God. God told Musa to put down his staff. The staff suddenly turned into a snake. At this, the prophet Musa began to flee. Yet God told him not to be afraid and revealed that he was in safety. The prophet Musa picked up his staff. That staff would later be the first miracle he would employ against Pharaoh. God gave the prophet Musa a second miracle. He put his hand to his shirt front, and when he brought it out again, it was pure white, without blemish. With these miracles and his commands, God told the prophet Musa to go to Pharaoh. He also made Musa's brother, Harun, a prophet and a companion to the prophet Musa. Go to him and say, We are your Lord's messengers, so send the tribe of Israel away with us and do not punish them. We have brought you a sign from your Lord. Peace be upon those who follow the guidance. Musa appeared before Pharaoh with these words. But Pharaoh sought to deny these words instead of paying heed to them. Pharaoh and those around him thought that the prophet Musa's aim was to seize power by changing the traditional religion of Egypt. That was because Pharaoh and his circles obtained great benefits from that religion. If that religion were to change, Pharaoh would lose all his power. Musa's intention was far from desiring to rule Egypt. Musa's request was for the release of the children of Israel who had been living under the most terrible conditions. In response to that request, 
Pharaoh said the prophet Musa had been raised in the palace and brought up the question of the man he had killed. Musa's response to all such mistreatment was one particular to a true believer who unconditionally submits to his destiny and has a full grasp of its implications. He, Musa, said, At the time I did it, I was one of the misguided, and so I fled from you when I was in fear of you. But my Lord gave me ripe judgment and made me one of the messengers. Finding himself in a difficult position in the face of the Prophet Musa's powerful words and proofs, Pharaoh uttered the slander that Musa was mad. He also threatened the Prophet Musa with prison unless he recognized Pharaoh's alleged divinity. At these words, the Prophet Musa revealed the proofs, the sign of his prophethood. So he threw down his staff and there it was, unmistakably a serpent. Pharaoh and those around him claimed that what they had seen could only be done by magic. That was because they were so blindly devoted to the pagan religion they had inherited from their ancestors. They set out to find rivals to the prophet Musa, whom they had accused of being a magician. News of this reached the greatest magicians of the land. The prophet Musa chose a festival as the time for the encounter. That was because he wished all the people of Egypt to witness the truth. Pharaoh's magicians were ready to display their skills. The ropes and staffs they threw down appeared to be genuinely moving towards the prophet Musa. These events are described in the Quran. Musa experienced in himself a feeling of alarm. We said, have no fear, you will have the upper hand. Throw down what is in your right hand. It will swallow up their handiwork. Their handiwork is just a magician's trick. Magicians do not prosper wherever they go. Then Musa threw down his staff. The result was terrifying for the magicians. As they were deceiving people by making them believe that things were actually moving around, the Prophet Musa's staff swallowed up all their spells. The magicians threw themselves down in prostration. They said, We believe in the Lord of Harun and Musa. This miracle by the Prophet Musa was a means whereby the magicians came to believe in God. Yet Pharaoh was so arrogant that he threatened those sincere people who had chosen to believe with death. Pharaoh said, Do you believe in him before I have authorized you? He is your chief, the one who taught you magic. I will cut off your hands and feet alternately and have you crucified on palm trunks. Then you will know for certain which of us has the harsher and longer lasting punishment. The magician's response to Pharaoh revealed the sincerity of their belief and their courage. They said, We will never prefer you to the clear signs which have come to us, nor to him who brought us into being. Decide on any judgment you like. Your jurisdiction only covers the life of this world. We have had faith in our Lord so that he may forgive us for our mistakes and for the magic which you have forced us to perform. God is better and longer lasting. The magician's defeat by the prophet Musa and their later turning to faith clearly revealed the twisted nature of the pharaonic system. Pharaoh was left with nothing rational to say, but stubbornly and arrogantly denied the existence of God and the prophethood of Musa.
One after another, God sent various disasters upon Pharaoh and his subjects, a people obstinate in denial. First, a great period of drought began in Egypt, where water was of such major importance. Agricultural products diminished in availability, and famine ensued. Disasters were occurring everywhere in the land. In spite of them, however, Pharaoh and his inner circle did not abandon their perverse polytheistic practices. They were zealously devoted to the religion of their ancestors. Yet this was not all that befell them. God visited a great many disasters on this people. Following the drought, he sent powerful rains and storms, the like of which had never before been seen in Egypt. Locusts and lice demolished the fields and the crops. Insects covered the cities like black clouds. All the cities of Egypt were plagued by frogs. They were everywhere, in people's homes and on the streets. The water from the river Nile and from the wells turned red with blood. The people of Egypt were now racked by thirst. Despite everything, however, they still continued in their denial. As these torments followed on each other's heels, Pharaoh and those around him attempted to deceive the prophet Musa with a cunning that was doomed to failure. Whenever the plague came down on them, they said, Musa, pray to your Lord for us by the contract he has with you. If you remove the plague from us, we will definitely believe in you and send the tribe of Israel away with you. But when we removed the plague from them for a fixed term which they fulfilled, they broke their word. All these disasters described in the Quran have been confirmed by findings from archaeological excavations. The Ipuver papyrus discovered in the early 19th century describes the scale of the catastrophe in Egypt. Plague is throughout the land. Blood is everywhere. All the waters that were in the river have turned to blood. The land is left over to its weariness like the cutting of flax. The palace was ruined in a moment. For nine days, there was no exit from the palace. No one could see the face of his fellow. Eventually, God commanded the prophet Musa to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. As God had commanded, the prophet Musa and his people secretly departed from Egypt at midnight. Pharaoh was consumed by a terrible anger. He regarded himself as the owner and so-called God of the children of Israel. In addition, it would mean a loss of manpower. He mobilized his soldiers and set out after the children of Israel. The children of Israel came to the shores of the sea as they fled from Pharaoh and his men. By now, Pharaoh and his troops were close enough to see the children of Israel. Panic and despair engulfed the people of Musa. There was no means of escape. Yet the prophet Musa was devoted to God with great submission and trust. He said, Never. My Lord is with me and he will guide me. Commanded by God to strike the sea with his staff, as described in Surah 26, verse 63, the prophet Musa did so. Miraculously, God divided the waters of the sea, leaving a dry path in the middle, which the children of Israel immediately followed. Pharaoh and his soldiers were so audacious as to chase the children of Israel into the sea. However, after the children of Israel had safely crossed to the other side, the waters suddenly began to close in. Pharaoh and his army, who had taken him as a god, were all drowned in this miracle. At the last moment, however, 
Pharaoh tried to repent, but his repentance was not accepted. These events are described thus in the Quran. We brought the tribe of Israel across the sea, and Pharaoh and his troops pursued them out of tyranny and enmity. Then, when he was on the point of drowning, he, Pharaoh, said, I believe that there is no God but him in whom the tribe of Israel believe. I am one of the Muslims. What, now? When previously you rebelled and were one of the corruptors, Today we will preserve your body so you can be a sign for people who come after you. Surely many people are heedless of our signs. Scientists have long been investigating how the dividing of the Red Sea described in the Quran and the Torah might have taken place. One striking discovery from this research is a ridge on the floor of the Dead Sea. This underwater ridge is found in the Gulf of Aqaba, an extension of the Red Sea. According to one interpretation, the path taken by the Prophet Musa led across this ridge. According to scientists, a powerful wind blowing from the east could have uncovered this ridge. Doron Knopf, a professor of ocean sciences at Florida University, constructed a complete model of the ridge in the Red Sea in order to test this thesis. During the experiment, Professor Knopf observed that when the wind was applied to the model, a dry path was indeed opened up. The Prophet Musa's crossing of the Red Sea may have taken place in this way. There is no doubt, of course, that God knows best. Archaeological findings shed light not just on the dividing of the Red Sea, but also on the drowning of Pharaoh and his army. For years, scientists have been searching for traces of Pharaoh's army in the depths of the Red Sea. Their research has arrived at some striking conclusions. These images were taken in the Gulf of Aqaba, which connects the Sinai Peninsula to Saudi Arabia. This sand surface brought to mind a ridge in the sea. The important thing, however, was the seaweed appearing here and there. This seaweed needs to cling to a solid base in order to survive. Most importantly of all, these seaweeds assume the form of the materials they cling to, even if these subsequently disappear. This seaweed encountered by scientists had a different property. There were no rocks or stones anywhere in the sea. Yet this seaweed resembled the wheels of the chariots of Pharaoh's army. More astonishing findings emerged as the research continued. A bronze chariot wheel found on the sand. This chariot wheel was in all likelihood left behind by Pharaoh's army, which was drowned under the waters. The Prophet Musa and his people set out for a place where they could live in safety. During the course of that journey, however, most of the children of Israel displayed weaknesses of faith and morals. The children of Israel came under the influence of the Egyptian culture, embracing some of their perverted customs and ideas. Their encounter with an idolatrous tribe on their way brought to light this tendency towards idolatry. In their ignorance, some Israelites were influenced by this tribe and asked the Prophet Musa to build an idol for them to worship. We conveyed the tribe of Israel across the sea and they came upon some people who were devoting themselves to some idols which they had. They said, Musa, give us a god just as these people have gods. He said, 
You are indeed an ignorant people. What these people are doing is destined for destruction. What they are doing is purposeless. He said, should I seek something other than God as a deity for you when he has favored you over all other beings? The Prophet Musa and his people set out for Mount Horeb. According to the Quran, God had made an appointment with them on the right-hand side of the mount. The Prophet Musa would spend 40 days on this mountain. Musa impatiently left his tribe behind and departed early. He left his people under the care of Harun. On the mountain, God once again spoke to the prophet Musa. He gave him tablets on which his commandments had been written and commanded the people to abide strictly by them. At this point, the unbelievers amongst the Israelites seized the opportunity presented by the Prophet Musa's absence. Despite all the many miracles vouchsafed to them, they constructed an idol with their own hands and began worshipping it. That idol was a golden calf. Musa was unaware of the lapse committed by his people. God informed him of the transgression and of the existence of a hypocrite among them by the name of Samaritan. At this, the prophet Musa returned to his people. The tribe were worshipping the idol and denying the existence of God. The prophet Musa did away with the discord caused by Samaritan with two important measures. He first expelled Samaritan and then destroyed the false idols he had constructed. He, Musa, said, Go, an outcast shall you be in this life, nor shall you escape your appointed doom. Look at your God to which you devoted so much time. We will burn it up and then scatter it as dust into the sea. Your God is God alone. There is no deity but Him. He encompasses all things in His knowledge. The Prophet Musa told his people to repent at once and to beg God's forgiveness of their mistake. As revealed in the verses of the Quran, the Almighty God accepted the Israelites' repentance. After the Israelites had left Egypt, God promised them a homeland. Their journey was to that land. However, the tribe continued to make difficulties for the prophet Musa throughout the journey. During this journey through the desert, God provided a miraculous food to keep the children of Israel from starving. This is described as manna and quails in the Quran and was an offering from God. However, the Israelites soon began complaining about it. And when you said, Musa, we will not put up with just one kind of food, so ask your Lord to supply us with some of what the earth produces, its green vegetables, cucumbers, grain, lentils, and onions. He, Musa, said, Do you want to replace what is better with what is inferior? Go back to Egypt, then you will have what you are asking for. The ignorance of the Israelites continued even after they reached the Promised Land. When the Prophet Musa told them to enter the Promised Land without looking behind them, the tribe said that there were no foreigners there. They then went even further, and they said, We will never enter it, Musa, as long as they are there. So you and your Lord go and fight. We will stay sitting here.
Therefore, Musa pleaded to his lord and asked him to save him and his brother Harun from this insolent people. He, Musa, said, My lord, I have no control over anyone but myself and my brother, so make a clear distinction between us and this deviant people. He, God, said, the land will be forbidden to them for forty years during which they will wander aimlessly about the earth. Do not waste grief on this deviant people. The children of Israel were prohibited from the promised land for forty years due to their insolence towards God and His Messenger. Throughout the course of his life, the prophet Musa waged a great struggle to tell his people and the people of Egypt about the true religion and to free them from their twisted beliefs. He overcame all the obstacles placed in his path. He tried to communicate God's message, even at the cost of his own life. During that period, he was devoted to God with an infinite trust and faith. No matter what the conditions, he sought help from him and took refuge in him. For much of his life, Musa had tried to communicate God's message to his people. He strove to save his tribe from the worship of idols and guide them to the true religion. His aim was merely to warn people and save them from the torment of hell, a mission which he carried solely to earn the good pleasure of God. To this purpose, he had confronted Pharaoh and had attempted to rid his people's beliefs of superstition. Nevertheless, he became the object of the cruelties of Pharaoh as well as his own people. However, he was a noble servant who lived merely to attain the good pleasure of God, and our Lord saved him from all difficulties inflicted upon him. These are the lessons to be drawn from the ingratitude of the children of Israel, a people who did not follow in their prophet's footsteps, who turned their backs to the religion entrusted to them, and so perverse as to say, you and your Lord go and fight. God has warned mankind against succumbing to the insolence of the children of Israel towards their prophet. You who believe, do not be like those who abused Musa, God absolved him of what they said, and he was highly honored with God. <laughs> 